Muy buenas tardes. Eh, Good afternoon. I would like to greet the delegation of the state of Ecuador, the representative of the elect victims. To my colleagues and the team of the executive secretariat, we now open this uh, session, case 13807, Mr. Velasquez Coelho and Alvear Macias against Ecuador. In this hearing, we will listen to um, Mr. Jorge Alvear, uh, an elect victim, and we will also listen to Richard Villa Gomez, who is an expert witness. And when these uh, statements are made, we will have 10 minutes for the petitioner to ask any questions. And we will also have 10 additional minutes so that the state can ask questions. And then the commission will have 10 more minutes. This will occur with each of the uh, statements. And in the last part, we will have a space for the arguments to be presented by the different parties. We will have 15 minutes for each of the parties to do that. And both parties can use five additional um, minutes in order to respond. So based on this agenda, we will open the hearing. I will give the floor to the Deputy Secretary, Executive Secretary, Marisol Blanchard. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon to everyone. This case is related to the elect responsibility of the Ecuadorian state for the elect lack of prevention and investigation of the acts of violence that occurred in April 2007 against the elect victims who were members of the Constitutional Court of the Republic of Ecuador. It also asks the arbitrary nature of their dismissal from said court without due process. On May 19, 2019, the Commission approved an admissibility report 73-19. Nineteen. In said report, the Commission declared the admissibility in relation to the rights established in Articles 5, 8, 9, 11, 23, 25, and 26 of the American Convention in relation to its Articles 1.1 and 2 of such instrument. The purpose of this hearing is to deepen the parties' arguments on the merits and receive information on the current status of the case. The commission will hear the testimony of the elect victim offered by the petitioner and of an expert witness offered by the state. I will give the floor to the commissioner now. Thank you. Thank you, Marisol. We will now start with the statement of Jorge Alvear. And afterwards, I request i will now request him to state his full name place of birth and place of residence good afternoon commissioners good afternoon dr estuardo rolon i will answer my name is jorge guillermo alver macias i was born in june 21 1949 in Guayaquil, Ecuador, where I live. Thank you. I will now ask the technical team to uh, start the timer and I will give the floor so the petitioners can ask the questions. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Dr. Alvear, you were part of the Constitutional Court since February 2016, and you were in that position. Yes, that is what happened. Is it true that in April 2007, while you and other members of the court 
were in that body, different mobs from the political parties entered violently in that building. Yes, that's truth. Could you inform in this hearing regarding the facts and circumstances that took place in that day in April 2007? Yes, on that day at approximately 2 p.m., we had been summoned by the president of the court to discuss an appeal presented by 57 uh, congressmen regarding uh, um, an amparo that had been action that had been denied proposed in connection to the destitution that they had received from the uh, Supreme Electoral Tribunal. And immediately we started discussing that issue because the court was in permanent sessions as in the previous days, there had been a threat against, against our stability related to our dismissal from representative of the official and governing party. After reading the uh, vote, six out of nine members approved the resolution and we reinstated 50 out of 57 congressmen who had credited the right to for that. There were two votes, votes against and immediately an hour and a half afterwards, the president of the court moved to a room next to it in order to give a press conference and explain the reasons why we uh, took that decision and all media outlets were present. And when we, when he started explaining the result of the voting, suddenly, abruptly different persons identified related to uh, political parties um, political parties that it was the official governing party and they had flags they had blunt objects and we had to find refuge in a bathroom close to the plenary room Fortunately, we were able to to escape from the mobs. These uh, persons were looking for us in every floor in the building, but they could not find us. We were locked in that small bathroom with four other members. And after an hour and 15 minutes, when and uh, 45 minutes when we could not listen to the voices of the uh, demonstrators one police officer uh, told us we could use the private uh, elevator of the president in order to uh, move to the basement and they asked us to find shelter under some beds that were in the basement. We stayed there for two more hours and the uh, demonstrators finally left because they couldn't find us, but they were outside the building. So in order to leave, we had to use, we had to go through uh, some uh, demonstrators who hit us, who threw different objects uh, such as rocks at us and insulted us. There were very difficult times and due to this psychological and physical violence, we believe that our life was at uh, imminent risk and probably will not be able to leave that place in order to tell that terrible story. At that moment, I remember a visit I had received days before from the undersecretary of the president in the legal area, Alexis Mera, 
who visited me and requested on behalf of the President of the Republic uh, for my vote to be against the congressman. I told him at that time that at act independently, that although I had been part of the executive, my responsibility was to be independent. And if the congressmen were right, I wouldn't deny that option to them. When this, when I answered this, Mr. Alexis Mera, the legal advisor of the presidency, stood up, shook hands with me and said, Dr. Alvear, you do not need this position. And that moment, I did not relate that expression to the situation, but as I hid in that bathroom and I feared for my life, that warning came to my mind. That meant that he was going to dismiss me from the court. And at night, the President of the Republic made a press conference from Bachala. And if you allow me to do so, I could I would like to share that short uh, video that lasts one minute and a half. Can I share the video? Hello. I am sorry, I have some connectivity issues. My screen has frozen. Do you hear me, Mr. Jorge Alvear? Yes, I can hear you. I was asking you for your permission in order to share a video with President Correa's statement that night. I asked the Secretary of Petitions and Cases I don't know if you can share the video. I understand that you should answer direct questions, but I would like the secretary to confirm this. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, it is part of, the, if this is part of the story he's trying to uh, narrate, I believe that we can allow him to play the video. Thank you. We are not able to listen to the video yet. No, no, no. We, we cannot see the video. What happened? Okay. You have eight minutes left. You have one minute left. Mr. Alviar, while well, we try to fix that after the decision of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal in April 2007, were you able to continue in your position in the Constitutional Court? No, because we were dismissed the, on the following day by the National Congress. Was there any, um, any kind of notification? No, we did not receive any notifications. There was no process or proceeding. We learned about that through the media and the decision made by the National uh, Congress was uh, published in the official bulletin in August that year, many months afterwards. So you were not notified. No, I was not. After this, were you, did you suffer any other threats? Yes. That night after uh, 
President Correa's uh, statement. Unfortunately, we were not able to listen to that, but he threatened uh, to start legal actions, which the president of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal also ratified. And some days afterwards, a representative of the Movimiento Popular Democrático presented uh, filed a complaint before the Attorney General's office. For the perversion of the course of justice. ¿En qué and we, there was a situation of uncertainty because we didn't know if we were going to be detained and taken to jail. Thank you. Due to the fact that the time is out. Compartir pantalla para que podamos todos continuar. I will ask you to stop sharing the screen. Thank you. And now we will give 10 minutes to the state to ask their questions. Sí, sí. Me Hello, uh, Commissioner Rallon, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you and time is running. You have 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Commissioner Rallon. This is Alonso Fonseca from the uh, state's uh, uh, general attorney's office. I will uh, ask questions to Dr. Jorge Alvear. Good afternoon. I will be asking a few questions. The state considers it's important that the commission analyzes some of the facts, and we will review some of these uh, questions. I will ask you, if you can, that your answers are very specific, if uh, yes or no answers, correct or incorrect, but of course, if any of the questions require more details for their answer, of course, uh, that is appropriate. Dr. Alvear, uh, related to some of the facts in the Inter-American uh, report, which has been alleged by the petitioners, do you consider this is correct or incorrect that months before you were dismissed from your uh, office as a member of the court, there was already a legal discussion as regards as if your term in office uh, required was to of 12 months or or of 11 months. Is this correct or incorrect? Could you repeat the question? Of course, of course, yes. M months prior of you being dismissed as members of the constitutional court was there already a legal debate as regards that if your time in office corresponded to a four-year uh, mandate or 11-month mandate well as i already expressed the appointment by the national congress issued as regards the appointment of nine uh, members was for a time in office of four years but what was anticipated by the government and the uh, ruling movements in office was that since they there were no congressmen there because they did not present a list of congressmen for the elections they wanted to have a majority in the chamber in congress so it was necessary that the substitute people that would fill in those uh, dismissed people, they would uh, amount to a majority. So it was a concern to this uh, ruling party members that this appeal could get to the constitutional court, which had been uh, dismissed by Judge Pimel, and that the members of the court would admit that appeal. So they were uh, trying to find a mechanism to dismiss us. They thought uh, there could be an impeachment, but no, there was no causes. They thought maybe they could interpret a 
differently to actually point out that us had been appointed to fulfill the time uh, of some other members that had been dismissed two or three years prior, which had their own alternate substitutes. And the third possibility that they could take was to actually, well, a, a political decision. That is, it was not clear to them, but this was what precisely made that the court uh, declared that it was a permanent uh, uh, out of office, declaring that any decision besides not respecting our appointments would be in constitution illegal and authoritarian. Okay, so where was this debate, uh, this legal debate uh, informed? Are there any documents? Yes, there are documents. It's on the newspapers and on several publications that comprise the, the report. So there was a legal debate on this, right? No, no, there wasn't any legal debate, actually. What, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but what, was was that there were several news that were picking up uh, several statements, but there was no actually a legal debate. The, the Congress was not in, in, in action. Well, this is important to this second question because could you confirm if in February 2006, February 2006, that is during the same months that you were appointed, there, that discussion was already been, already taking place because our research team has gathered information plus your, your reports. So on February 2006, was this debate taking place? Could you confirm that? No. It wasn't happening. I repeat, if you're referring to this um, minutes, this acts of the dismissal, you can see very evidently that there is a sort of, how can I say this, a, a lack of clarity in the reasoning of the different congressmen. What was very clear was that they had to dismiss us at any uh, using any uh, reasoning. And actually the Congress in its decision, they analyze the possibility of uh, taking us to the court for the prevention of the course of justice. That is, they, are, they were mixing up this with legal issues. Do you know if any former members of the Constitutional Court, and you, you said that in February 2006, there was no debate going on. And so any ex-member of the court had publicly stated that it was the Congress that had to define, that had to determine the time in office. Could you actually name this person? I don't recall. Well, it was Dr. Jose Garcia Falconi, there are uh, public statements and on the part of the merits, we will explain this. Another question, in a different time, could you confirm if any other ex-member on April 2007 had said this, and I quote, the current members of the legal system have uh, fulfilled their time in office which uh, ended on January the 16th, 2007. Could you confirm who was this person, who was this ex-member of the Constitutional Court? Look, Dr. Fonseca, I was appointed, this is part of the file, and my appointment was for four years in office. I cannot possibly doubt an authority such as the President of the Congress. Dr. Lucero, may he rest the peace. Well, this questions, I'm sorry to interrupt, is so that the Inter-American Commission has the complete outlook of the whole debate and the whole context. And this 
has been picked up by the media, as you said. What I'm asking is especially something that can be uh, identified. Only in motion of order, let's uh, try to be direct the questions. Well, the questions have been direct, Mr. Commissioner, but I think it's important to have this reflection anyway. Thank you so much. Doctor, could you confirm by yes or no if there was a next member of the Constitutional Court that was a reason for your uh, for you leaving your position? Uh, who who was this? What member? Doctor, did you hear the question? Yes. But can you tell me who you are referring to? Yes, we're speaking by about Victorio Olvera, who uh, actually caused you to resign. Well, Dr. Viterio Luvera acted politically in the court always. He was part of the Ronrosista movement from Ecuador. And during our dismissal, he uh, motioned for our impeachment. He was against uh, reinstating the congressmen, but uh, due to a political uh, reason, not due to legal reasons, because he never wanted to actually say what, what, what was, what were those reasons, and he tried to delay this decision. And not only that, he knew, as other members, he knew about this attack. He knew that these mobs were coming. So this is why, in one of the video that videos that is on the file, he leaves the tribunal, the court first by changing his clothes because he knew that we were going to be attacked. Okay, doctor, let, let's go, let's move to a different topic. Let's let's stop uh, the question here because the 10 minutes are up. It's up to the Inter-American Commission to intervene now. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask second vice president, uh, Commissioner Margaret Mac McCauley, if she has any questions. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and may, may I greet um, all the parties here present this afternoon, both for the state and on behalf of the petitioners, um, and the petitioners themselves and the witnesses. I, I um, wanted to ask Ms. Alvea, um, could you please, um, give us information as to how the decision to terminate you impacted you and your family as concisely as you can, because I have a couple of other questions. Bueno, eh, muchas well, gracias por la... Thank you for your question. That is very important. Honorable Madam Commissioner, let's see, from the point of view of the moral damage, this was very powerful. My family thought us the ones held for four hours inside that uh, room, thought that my life was going to end on that day. Oh, of course, at the level of the community, professional uh, friends. I had done something and the that, that was a mistake. And the president of the Republic was accusing me and my colleagues uh, were being accused because of the decision we made, a decision we considered to be just and constitutional. Of course, my family suffered these professional and personal damage by the media and from the higher authorities. Could I, could I uh, ask for one more question because there are lots of um, my colleagues need to ask questions. Um, is there not fixed and clear legal provision in within your state, in your constitution or in law of some other law 
which deals with the security of tenure of judges, especially judges of the Constitutional Court. Do you not have any legal provision like that? And was there not any when you were this, um, terminated? Well, it was in force uh, the Constitution of 1998, and this Constitution of 1998 established expressly that the mandate of the members of the Constitutional Court was of four years. And when I took office, I thought I was going to be working for four years. I prepared myself. I left aside many professional commitments in other responsibilities in order to take office. And the interruption of my, of my mandate caused not only a moral, but a personal um, damage at the level of my marriage. And the constitution backed me up in order to be in the office for the period for which I had been elected. I think I'll end there because I don't want to be unfair to my colleagues. Thank you. I do have more questions, but there we go. Time. Thank you, Mr. President. Gracias, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Joel Hernandez, do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. President. I, I have a very short question. After you got to know through the media outlets about your dismissal, how were you formally notified about that? Thank you for the question, Mr. Commissioner Hernandez. I, we were never notified. I just got to know by reading the newspaper and I feared I was going to be detained because some friends were calling me, uh, warning me that I could be detained because the government said they were going to prosecute us for uh, making that decision in favor of the congressman. I officially get to know about my dismissal through the publication of this resolution in August, many months afterwards. Thus, we could not uh, present an amparo action as we did afterwards because there was no proof of our dismissal because we had not been notified. Do you hear me, Mr. President? You are on mute. Do you hear me? Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. I will ask Commissioner Bernal whether he has any questions. Yes, thank you, Mr. President, for this hearing. I would like to ask a question and I would like to listen to the opinions of Mr. Villar and the representatives of the state as well. And you, do you think, I would like to listen to both viewpoints. He, by dismissing the, them, was there uh, an excessive use of power in order to uh, follow the order, as we are questioning Mr. Alviar, we will listen to Mr. Alviar's answer first. Thank you. Yes, without a doubt, a public official, such as the member of the court, the judge of the constitutional court, 
or um, judge of the Supreme Court or the National Court of the Supreme Electoral Tribunal could only be dismissed or it, his term of office could be terminated with uh, an impeachment. And that impeachment did not uh, occur. Without a doubt, the National Congress, by acting as it did, did not follow the constitutional order and the uh, power or the mandate of the Congress at that time. So without a doubt, it was an illegal action that it corresponds to dictatorship regimes. Thank you, Commissioner Bernal. I have a question. We do not have much time. Mr. Alvear, what was your experience when you filed the Amparo action before the uh, Justice of Ecuador regarding your dismissal? First of all, the judge in the first instance said that the action had been proposed um, that the time period for this presentation was not uh, correct as the Attorney General's office had established that as well. So we were not able to be reinstated to our uh, position after that decision, which lacks any legal foundation. I'm sorry, I can add something. And when we appeal the decision, we had to file the appeal to the court made up by the persons who were replacing us. So they could not uh, say we were right because they were um, in our position. They should not have heard our case, but they denied our appeal. Thank you, Mr. Bernal. We have concluded your uh, statement, and now we will listen to Mr. Richard Villa Gomez as expert witness, and I will ask him to state his full name, place of birth, and place of residence. Good afternoon, Mr. President, dear commissioners. My name is Richard Italo Villa Gomez Cabezas. I was born in Yobamba, Ecuador in January 9, 1973. Thank you. As you are an expert witness proposed by the state, the state will start with its questions. I will now give the floor to the state for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, commissioners. Mr. Expert Witness, good afternoon. First of all, to ask this question, we will ask you to please tell your experience as a member of the academia in connection with constitutional matters. I am a professor in the university. I have been a professor for 22 years. I teach at the Universidad Andina, Simón Bolívar of Ecuador. I have published 23 books and regarding different legal matters, such as constitutional matters. Thank you, Mr. Expert Witness. Could you tell the commission whether you have had experience as a lawyer? I have worked as eight, uh, for eight years in the criminal uh, areas and, and the Constitutional Court of uh, Ecuador. And the, can you tell the 
commission, you have been called to talk about the Amparo um, action. How was this action presented? And in connection to the constitution of 1998, yes, I have been asked to discuss in abstract about this. First of all, the Amparo action has to do with a uh, constitutional action aimed at the protection of the citizens before actions or omissions of the public power and the adoption of urgent measures in order to stop, prevent, compensate circumstances that led to the violation of rights. In particular, the Samparo action had a residual nature, which means that should be and other actions should be carried out in order to um, implement the um, constitutional uh, protection action that we're talking about. One of the serious issues this had was the fact of a lack or insufficient margin of reparation, not only to declare the violation of rights, but to establish its reparation if possible. The competent body to deal with this were first instance judges in the civil um, civil judges. So Mr. Expert Witness, was it aimed at the action of any public authority? So could the National Congress be a public authority? Yes, that was possible. Perfect. And you mentioned the characteristics. This means that although there was a Uh, were, were there any additional actions and was it a, a precautionary measure? Yes, the aim of this action was to prevent the violation action and determine measures to that aim. And there was a framework of reparation that was established for that in compliance with the constitution of 1988. So there were other channels as well. Yes. In those channels that you mentioned and take it into account this precautionary nature, what urgent characteristics in connection to the seriousness of this action could you mention? because I don't know if you can explain this, take into account the jurisprudence. This was established by the law, was the law of constitutional control established in different conditions. First of all, for an irreparable damage to exist. And in that sense, the constitutional court established a long, uh, jurisprudence pointing out that these are uh, different elements and the analysis had, uh, had to take place within the decision, but there were two concepts that were mistaken. The time that had elapsed for the, for the filing the constitutional action and there was no temporal, um, there was no period established at that time, but it had to do with the three characteristics that I have already mentioned. Was this known by all, by all lawyers that these requirements should be met? And could you explain what actions had been uh, dismissed because these uh, requirements had not been met? Well, all these features uh, have to be present. If there is an absence of one of them, the guarantee cannot be admitted. But the Constitutional Court 
by uh, knowing this appeal and, and hearing this appeal, knew that this was not, uh, cannot be admitted. I think these are all the questions, Mr. Expert Witness. You have been very kind, and I think you have uh, clearly spoken about the nature of the action of Empower for the Commission. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and thank you for uh, giving us the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, representative of the state. Now we go to the petitioners so that they can uh, ask questions to the expert witness for eight, 10 minutes. You have the floor, petitioners. You are muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. So, uh, in the exercise of uh, position in you indicated you had experience in the criminal area, right? Yes, that's correct. You also said when you were describing some of the elements regarding the action of Amparo that the imminent, that the impending nature was not well understood because many people related it to time and actually this is not really related to time. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. Could you uh, provide more detail as to what is the regulation that establishes the this nature of the Amparo action? Well, this was in Article 95 of the uh, Constitution of 1998, and legally it was in Article 46 of the then Law of uh, Constitutional Control. So that would be the regulations on which all that is related to the constitutional amparo is, is laid down. Is that correct? Yes. So no any other uh, norms or regulations include this. Well, for other uh, aspects that are not provided for in this uh, law, this, the civil, uh, proceedings code uh, applied to these cases. So as an expert of, uh, in constitutional matters, do you think that the former constitutional court had that power, authority to, uh, to provide uh, binding actions according to the 1998 constitution the court had the authority to decide on constitutional matters. Could they uh, issue any binding actions or was there any jurisprudence? Well, the mechanism to adopt the this criteria of the court were embedded in the constitution and the law, and they provided for that there had to be a unanimous criteria on reasoning regarding the issue and the decision taken related to that legal matter. Okay, very. thank you very much, Dr. Villagomez. Very well, I, as I understand your questioning on the question on the part of the petition is, has ended. So now we go to uh, the commission so that we can ask questions to the experts. I ask the second vice president, Commissioner Macaulay, if she has any questions. Um, thank, thank you, Madam, uh, Mr. President. I'm, I'm sorry. I thought my, my sister president was present for a moment. Um, I, I'm, I'm not a, a civil lawyer and, and your processes are are uh, not as well known to me as my common law system. But um, am I to understand that 
the um, power filed by the petition, um, um, Mr. Alvear and his colleagues was, was denied by the court, which was set up after they had been dismissed. Uh, okay, let, let me ask all my questions. That's first question. Secondly, if that is so, is that accepted under your legal system as an independent, as being the case being considered by an independent tribunal in law? Thank you very much. I have to acknowledge that there was a first instance court that could uh, dismiss or admit the appeal and the last court that had the author authority to decide was the constitutional court in this concrete case if there had been any uh, any issues related to the members of the body the constitutional framework offered two possibilities one the excuse on and to the uh, recusation the, f the first option is to question one of the members of the Court. The second option is that the judge can uh, excuse himself from the case by providing causes. As I understand, none of these options were in place for this specific case. And on the other hand, the court that uh, heard this merits case had not the authority to do so. Commissioner Joel Hernandez, do you have any questions? I don't have any questions, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Vernal, do you have any questions? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to ask the same question to the expert uh, as I asked Mr. Alvea, is, and that is if this case, do you consider that there was any uh, crossing of the limits on the part of the uh, authority that dismissed these people and do you consider that in this case there was a system to guarantee judicial independence for the uh, processing of uh, Mr. Alvear's uh, arguments? Well, the mechanisms to ensure judicial independence are two. Uh, these two previous ones I mentioned before. Uh, excusing oneself is has to do with the judge being excused uh, by motu proprio. And the other mechanism uh, has to do with questioning uh, the, the authority. And this is in line with the Constitution. In the case of a dismissal of members, the Congress had the authority to act, but there is a debate as to under which mechanisms and as regards the guarantees of due process. Because the the mechanisms that were authorized were the impeachment mechanisms. I also have, thank you very much, I also have some questions. First is that we were told that the untimely uh, filing of the Empire Action was debated. And my question is if there is any uh, specific time period in which the Empire Actions have to be filed. No, Mr. Commissioner, there was no uh, date or specific time period for this. And also in the current regulatory framework, there is no uh, uh, time limit but however as i was saying the mistake is that when we relate the uh this impending imminent nature and and the empower 
do you consider that the constitutional court at the time provided guarantees of uh, impartiality and judicial independence which are needed to decide on the on this empire action since the these two mechanisms were not activated there was this was not so, but this is subject to discussion if actually due to the members that comprise the, the body could question uh, the, the decisions taken by the body. Whether in Ecuador at the time, uh, any mechanisms that allow that people, the magistrates w could voluntarily uh, excuse themselves and other people could join the committee. Yes, Mr. Commissioner, this happens when a judge for his own, under his own decision, establishes that he is prohibited from hearing such case. So as an expert in those circumstances, do you consider that it is reasonable that there was uh, causes for that uh, for that mechanism to be applied. Well, from a legal perspective, there have to be two elements. There have to be causality, that is a cause provided in the norms. And second, this excuse have, has to be accepted by the other members, acting members of the body. In this concrete case, this mechanism was not applied because despite this option being available the whole time. Very well. Well, those are all my questions. So I'm ending the time uh, for the commission to question the expert witness. I thank you for your participation. And we will go now to the next part of the hearing. This is the part of the arguments by the parties. The petitioner party has 15 minutes to uh, provide their allegations, their arguments. So the 15 minutes start now. You are muted. The first five minutes, we will show uh, a video and then I will intervene if you will allow me. Of course, you may proceed. The rage of uh, thousands of uh, demonstrators uh, They managed to enter the building by crossing the door. They went to the ninth floor to seek for the members, to look for the members who hid in under other in, in other door behind other doors. Another group was uh, guarding the outside, outside the building to uh, prohibit their exit. We will be here the whole time and we will convene an indigenous revolt. There, we can see here the demonstrators inside the building, inside the court. It was when the president of the Constitutional Court uh, uh, announced the reinstatement of the 50 congressmen that uh, a group of demonstrators burst in the room. They went in brutally to demonstrate their disagreement with the members. Ciro Guzman, militants of different groups were present there.
Meanwhile, Pachacuti demonstrators were also arriving outside the, the building. They were all calling themselves judges in this new conflict. Some members could exit the building from the back and the rest uh, exit during night while receiving the mistreatment of the demonstrators that were still there. In those images, you're seeing Santiago Velázquez, the president, and Jorge Alvear, who are leaving the building in the circumstances. Why is this the reaction? Because today, the Constitutional Court decided to reinstate the congressmen that were dismissed by the Supreme Electoral Court. This happened in the middle of a revolt because different militants came to interrupt this press conference in which this decision was to become official. MPD and Alianza País uh, militants managed to burst in to interrupt the defense of President Santiago Belán. It was to uh, prevent the fact that this was to become official to reinstate this congressman that were, had been dismissed on May the 7th. The members of the government went and hid in different rooms. This tribunal did not have the moral authority or legal authority to solve this issue. Outside, the manifestants uh, reacted against the decisions. They have managed to, to uh, act to be rightfully dismissed. Dear commissioners, as you have seen, what has to do with psychological attacks and all types of violence, well, uh, it's more evident than any other word. And despite this clarity, the state of Ecuador has never started or opened an investigation and has not sanctioned anyone for all those attacks and pressure that was suffered by the members. And actually, these people who burst in in the building took elements from the file that had to do with the resolution that had been adopted to reinstate the congressman. And then months later, the people who uh, were appointed uh, alleged the lack, the missing documents so that the decision would be void. So what happened in the next day, next day after this facts, the National Congress without having any uh, authority decided to terminate the term in office of these uh, members, acting, acting in contravention of the Constitution. So based on that constitutional regulation, which expressly spoke about four years, this appointment had been uh, made void. The National Congress had not the authority to do this. It could impeach them, but it, it never did this. No impeachment was opened and no decision was taken. Besides, the Congress that adopted this decision was not legally constituted anymore. As you could see, the previous day, there had already been a constitutional decision taken of immediate implementation under which the congressman had been reinstated. So those who were appointed as congressmen that day did not have any judicial uh, legal power to do so. Many people wanted to justify uh, with words because actually the text of the resolution follows and all uh, legal 
procedures, they wanted to justify their actions by saying that the Congress could interpret the Constitution. That is true at the time, but in order to do so, it had to follow a procedure which never happened. And also, even if they had interpreted the Constitution to take this decision, they required the two thirds majority votes in favor of this. And the decision was actually taken by a simple majority. So as you could see, it's clear that the goal was to uh, terminate this control uh, body to um, sort of uh, punish them to not follow the president at the time. The National Congress, when uh, it took this uh, decision, which had no uh, uh, reason in behind it, uh, could not have done it because if, if the president was not there, the first vice president had to chair the session and if not the second vice president, but actually not the first or second vice president were there. So the, uh, the substitute of the first vice president acted as, acted as chair and they bypassed the authority of the second vice president, vice president to chair the session. And of course, the National Congress, as any other public authority, can only act under the specific uh, uh, the specific powers that they were given. Many people said that since the president had changed and some organizations had changed, uh, new uh, candidates uh, should be sent to represent the members. First of all, the members were part of a three uh, part candidate list, of course, but the, the constitutional court cannot depend on any other branch, and even if a high, under this hypothesis that was never admitted, well, there should have been uh, a renewal of the whole constitutional court. They did not have any arguments and their aim was actually to terminate a, an independent constitutional court, which for the first and only time in the history of Ecuador and under my understand, as far as I understand, they did not comply with, with the fact that the, there was not uh, a a compliance with the term in office for these uh, uh, members. And actually for several weeks, the, the positions were vacant. Many people that, who had been detained or arrested uh, remained arrested because there was no one to hear their cases. So it's clear that what they sought was to prevent the functioning of a constitutional uh, body, such as the constitutional court. And they had to ensure that there was no possibility that the members tried to come back. So the previous day, as the decision was known, this uh, the documents were stolen so that then that would be the, the reasoning to uh, void the decision had been taken. There was a campaign to attack the members and actually they are, they are legally prosecuted effectively and they are prosecuted 
and being accused of an alleged crime of having uh, actually fulfilled their functions, that is to take a, to make a decision. The dis making a decision is the main action, the main obligation of a judge, and for that they were prosecuted. And this without taking into account many other attacks, such as the one uh, done by the president of the Republic at the time. Several months took to get those files. And I managed that file myself, so I'm not speaking of something I, someone has told me, it's some, something I have worked on. And to uh, impede that these persons could go back to their positions and recover their, their offices, well, four months, the, the publication of the decision of their dismissal took four months, which was published only at that time. And these people were never formally notified. And the decision was a decision taken without any cause. Well, it's true that it was apparently uh, based on a cause. The only legal uh, references are those who refer to the uh, four year term for the members of the Constitutional Court. There is no regulatory framework that can support this decision. And as a consequence, we come to this commission and we request that after the corresponding procedure, you declare the international responsibility of the Ecuadorian state for the infringement of this uh, articles of the commission in, according, in accordance to uh, Articles 1.1 and 2 of uh, the American Convention. Thank you very much to the petitioners. We go now to the 15 minutes allotted for this state for the final allegations. Thank you, Commissioner. Petitioners, representatives of the petitioners. I am Maria Fernanda Alvarez. I will speak on behalf of the state. Commissioners, this is a case in which we, the political context of Ecuador has been mentioned. Specifically, the constitutional the constitu constituent process that uh, concluded in the current constitution. For the state, it's very important to describe the facts and the legal arguments that should be discussed before a human rights international organization. The facts that need to be analyzed by the commission are the following. In 2006, the National Congress applying articles 130 and 275 of the political constitution in force to date appoints as members of the constitutional court among others both petitioners that appointment was made due to the absence of the incumbent uh, members that should end their mandate in 2007. in 2007 the national congress decides that nine members of the constitutional court would be dismissed, including both petitioners. Seven months afterwards, November 2007, petitioners presented an amparo action before the civil court in Pichincha. The first instance judge rejected that action because it considered it was uh, presented extempore. This was ratified in the appeal court. In this hearing has been said that the norm clarifies and there was no legal discussion regarding the uh, term of office 
these uh, members of the constitutional court should comply with the norm or the general period established by that norm is not being discussed. What is being discussed is the application of that period to a specific case of the members of the court. And against what has been uh, stated in this hearing, the legal debate regarding the term of office these members should comply with is not a debate that started in 2007 after the decision of the National Congress. And it was not a discussion ad hoc started in order to dismiss both of officials. It is very important for the Commission to bear this in mind. In February 2006, after the members of the Constitutional Court had been appointed and after the political context related to the current case started, the decision was implemented by the National Congress. And we can see in the media that makes reference to the different interviews to the congressmen and members of the Constitutional Court in that regard. In El Universo newspaper, newspaper, there is an interview to one of the members of the Constitutional Court that said that the application of that time period should be determined by the Congress that would um, be uh, in office. But before this commission, it is alleged that the dismissal of these members had to do with political retaliation out of uh, decision. And this shows the viewpoint of the members of the court because they believe they had a role in, the, in politics. Um, for, and thus we can see uh, that this was stated by them in their uh, arguments. The state wants to highlight that an international organization should not make decisions in connection to political dynamics within the state, especially when that is related to a social crisis. An international human rights organization can decide whether human rights were violated in those processes. But before this commission, they are trying to relate the present case to a political context and cases that are not related to such case. And making reference to stability of the judges, what is being requested to the commission that not knowing the um, its power is replacing the uh, Ecuadorian body that should be deciding on the application of these norms. The commission should analyze and define whether the decision made by the National Congress regarding this case was uh, correct or not, which goes against what the commission has already stated and what the International Court has already stated regarding the fact that it should not replace the role of domestic authorities in determining the application of current legislation. Due to the importance of the commission for victims of human rights violations in the region, it's of concern to the state that they want to take political uh, debates and individual interests before this body. The state is aware of the connection between democracy, political processes, and respect and guarantee of human rights. In that sense, it understands that to this international organization should analyze if this specific case, human rights were violated, uh, which are enshrined in the Inter-American Convention. The state with the legal analysis will show that human rights were not violated in the present case. The members of the Constitutional Court were dismissed by the competent body applying um, the legislation in force. The state had the legal instruments to respond to the legal uh, actions um, that was started by the petitioners. Regarding the Amparo action, due to the 
the state did not violate any legal warranties or the principle of legality. The state will show that personal integrity or political rights of the petitioners were not violated. Thank you, dear commissioners, for your for giving us this time. I just want to clarify some points. I think that is very clear the legal discussion that exists here. There is a constitutional court that was clearly appointed to replace for a specific period a constitutional court that took office before them. And this could be confirmed through the resolution between the National Congress and the documents that are available to make reference to these historical uh, events. And Article 10 of the law of constitutional control establishes that in those periods to replace a member of the constitutional court, an incumbent member, the alternate will remain in office for the period the incumbent has been replaced. So this establishes the replacement that was terminated. But there's an important part. If this was the application, interpretation of the National Congress, this is not an interpretation of the law. In fact, what the National Congress did is to exercise its power. And, and that's the question. Does the commission has does the commission have the power to analyze the uh, powers of a legislative power? But this resolution and B65 take into account Article 168 of the political constitution of the country at that time, whether it is possible to file an amparo action that has its own rules, as the expert witness has explained, it has a precautionary component, although there is also another component, a tutelary or supervisory um, nature. But we should analyze imminence urgency as a time period um, and not as a matter of expiration when, for example, we have to present or file an, a demand before uh, the system. But these functions or works because I'm going, I'm going to quote what the court has said. The power to oppose loses consistency and subjective rights that were potentially denied cannot be compensated through an amparo action. What do I mean? They have the channel, they have the means, but they did not use this remedy in the uh, time period. And there were other channels or remedies to debate what has been discussed here. So we are not using an appreciation of the state, but about 10 or 15 resolutions um, made by the constitutional court explaining this in that sense in that sense this amparo um, action was filed in a first instance and then before a court of appeals and that was uh, heard by the constitutional court which rejected this action based on the fact that the requirements were not fulfilled. This has a direct effect in connection with Article 8, the fact that there was due process, there was no challenge of the judges, and there was a fast and efficient remedy available. And when we look at Article 10 
of the law applied by the National Congress of a constitutional control, they made use of an attribution. So there cannot be a violation of Article 825 and 9 of the Inter-American Convention. I would like to mention some things that are related to Article 5, personal integrity. And this has to do with some of the things that we have seen in the videos. But this is possible when, when we are able to compare the information that the petitioners have incorporated to the file, especially in the admissibility stage and the uh, reads on the merits. There is, there's a lack of consistency today in Dr. Alviar's statement. We uh, heard that there was uh, police protection. In several reads, they said that there was no police protection and that there was an omission of state agents. And today, Dr. Alviar said that the police, police uh, provided a special uh, protection to lead them out the building. And if we look at the documentation, we will find that between 11 a.m. and 7 p.m., there was police protection during the, uh, during the incidents that prevented violations to occur regarding personal integrity. And in our, my last few seconds, I would like to point out that the presentation made by Dr. Alviar regarding the debate in 2006, this is something that is well documented and the state will incorporate that to the file. So the commissioners are aware of this, the discussion um, regarding the uh, term of office, whether they were 11 months or four months, that was something that was clear in the documents. Thank you. The petitioners can um, respond for five minutes now. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Several comments. We need to be to make reference to the documents. The Article 275 established that the uh, term of office lasted four years. If they had established that they will alternate members, how can we understand that there were nine incumbent and nine alternate members? So they may reference to the law of constitutional control, but that norm cannot be applicable to the case because there is no absence of a particular person. This was an appointment as you were able to see, but let's suppose a doubt had existed. If that were the case, then there, there should have been an interpretation. The interpretation is done through the channels established by law. And with the corresponding votes, this is not done because, well, it calls our attention. It says that there was always a feeling that the appointments were not into force, but the National Congress waited for that time to pass. Why did they, why the uh, term of office was not terminated before in February? Why did they not call um, a meeting? So this lacks any legal support. The constitutional court, they say the court wanted to hire a political role. The constitutional court, the only thing it did was to hear and solve an appeal regarding an amparo action that had been filed. 
And it did so. Why did it do so? Because that was its power and it was mandatory. A, a judge cannot say it will not solve or hear a case because there is certain feeling or it's uh, damaging a certain political sector. If they don't like the decision, well, you can have your own mind, your own peace of mind, but this uh, decision was timely made. And it has been pointed out They pointed out several uh, remedies. We are talking about the violation of fundamental rights of the Constitution. So the channel should be constitutional. It cannot be a channel, a legal channel. And we need to take into account the legislation that was in force at that time and that included certain exceptions and it had been drafted bearing in taking into account several um, political or social events. And in this case, the petitioners, if they had used that option and that it was not mandatory to them, they could have received the same uh, response because this could have happened in a court in Guayaquil and they would have pointed out the same thing. So it's clear, as the expert witness say, there was no time period established for the presentation or the filing or an amparo action. And that has been shown because First of all, they had, they were not notified and they cannot present any actions if they are not um, officially notified about that. We have seen the videos, how easy it was for people to enter the building and that it was very easy for them. In the morning, there was a police um, there were many policemen present, but they disappeared afterwards. Thank you very much. The state can reply, can respond for five minutes. So I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm sorry for the audio. Just uh, we, let's see some issues. There, this is a concrete case, and it has to do with debating if the Congress had the authority to do this. And the state repeats that this is not something that is apt for discussion for an, a body that is exercising its competencies under a treaty is actually uh, something under the internal domestic organization of the state, whether the Article 10 of the control constitutional law had to be applied or not, whether the term of office was 11 months or four years, etc. Actually, one month after the appointment, one member of the court itself referred that it was not very important if it was 11 months or four years because he thought so. But actually, in the end, the Congress is not interpreting anything, is the, the application that it has to provide is that the termination of the term of office is due to the term being 11 months long. Then you, we also speak about the Amparo action. What calls my attention is that the series of decisions and uh, sentences issued related to Amparo actions issued by the members of the court 
uh, themselves, the petitioners, and they do not determine that impending, the impending nature is a condition to apply this figure, this type. We have seen that there was a decision by the National Congress that was public, all national events at the moment were public, and they told that this was not a right being exercised because there had not been a notice, a notification. This is unfounded because we're speaking about the fact that the constitutional and power action was, was admitted as a precautionary measure. And finally, the court determined, actually it developed all this concept that the imminent nature is a condition that has to be applied. And they did not, uh, they used a different method, an administrative method to try this case is something that is quite common in Latin America. I uh, give the floor to Maria Fernanda Alvarez now. Thank you. I only wanted to uh, second my colleague, first of all, of course, it's not up to discussion the interpretation of a constitutional regulation. Actually, the National Congress applied a regulation to a concrete case solving a legal discussion that was in place from the moment itself of the appointment of these members and which is quite widely registered uh, seen in this news outlets which is something that the petitioners are using in this case and which will be provided for the commission now, as regards the empower action which was filed by the petitioners what is up to debate is not the appropriateness or the effectiveness but actually the time that is seven months that uh, went by after that and this time untimely period was widely established in the jurisprudence of the constitutional uh, court which was made up by the petitioners these are the main topics that we should solve and i request the commission once again that they all the politically political uh, issues are uh, left aside and we only focus on the alleged violations of human rights on this case thank you very much we have uh, concluded with the allegations from the parties so very uh, briefly, let me ask my colleagues if they want to ask any further questions to the petitioners or to the state. Commissioner Joel Hernandez. Yes, Mr. President, I know we don't have much time, so this question could be uh, answered in writing later. I would like to know from the state how this legal debate is being uh, carried out as regards the mandate in office of the petitioners. I think it would be very useful to know if beyond the press debate, if there was any debate at the Congress since their appointment that is uh, documented in the minutes of the Congress, or actually if this has been documented at the moment that the Congress decided on their dismissal. Thank you, Mr. President. Commissioner Margaret, do you have any questions? Yes, I do indeed, um, Mr. President, thank you. Um, I, I wanted to put uh, those questions which both parties, both sides can, can deal with. And um, that the, you have stated the, the grounds for impeachment uh, of judges and so on. But do, do you accept as a state and just the other side that when someone who is a judge has been um, uh, dismissed for supposed misconduct of some kind, that they are entitled to due process and that that, that is a fundamental human rights um, issue? And secondly, 
do you also accept that the system of separation of powers within a state is a matter of conventionality, which is required under the inter-American system? And another, do you accept that judges are required not to bow to any political or other type of pressure in making their decisions on any matter whatsoever. And that whoever tries to do that is in acting in breach of the law. And secondly, do you accept that the failure to provide for someone who has been accused of malpractice of some kind to provide for them the time, the knowledge of what is they're, they're accused of, the time for preparing a defense and the actual uh, um, procedure for defense and fa facing their, their um, um, accuser. That being, I'll, I'll leave it at that, even though I do have more questions, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bernal. Thank you very much. I would like to also ask a question to the state, the same question that before, the question I uh, asked for the expert. One, if there was any uh, crossing of the limits on the part of the uh, institution, and then if the petitioners have had the in fact, uh, judicial guarantees to have a reply to his petition that was to be fair according to the legal systems in place. Very well, we are quite out of time, so I would ask you to um, send the answers in writing of the questions that we have uh, posed in this hearing. And before concluding with the uh, hearing, I want to thank the delegation of the state of Ecuador, the representatives of the alleged victims and the deponents as well. I inform you that both parties have uh, 30 days to present their observations in writing. And I thank you for your presentation participation, so I adjourn this hearing. Thank you very much.